Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Human Equation. This is episode five of Your Solution. Don't forget, check us out, www.thehumanequation.com. Our Instagram page, at The Human Equation. Follow us. Check us out on Facebook, like our page. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're not listening on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Play, you can find us there. All right, today we have a friend of mine from Youngstown. His name is Nick Wild. Nick has a bachelor's degree in athletic training. He's a police officer with the Trumbull County Sheriff's Office. He's a CrossFit Level 1 trainer and soon-to-be CrossFit gym owner, hopefully, right? How's it going, buddy? So that's the dream, man. That's the dream. It's taking a lot of time. How's everything going? It's going good. It's going good. We're uh, good. working out now in a global gym, trying to equipment and storage, trying to figure out a way to get it into a functional place. But it's part of the joy of trying to open a gym, I guess. I know those struggles. Let's kind of just go through what, what kind of got you into uh, wellness and fitness and, and are with that. I'm sorry. I, I think uh, it's breaking up now. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. I said, it's, it's perfectly uh, clear the whole what, time what, until we started doing the video and then it's, uh, it's just breaking started up. Started breaking up on you? Yeah. Yeah, I said, so what, uh, what, is, what got you into wellness and fitness in the first place, and what has been your biggest struggle with that throughout the years? Oh, man. Well, it's changed for me uh, throughout the years. I mean, um, I think having good role models as a, as a young kid even, I mean, I can remember getting to go down into the basement with my dad when he was working out, you know, from as a very, very young kid and always being around that, and I had uncles that... Uh, we're always in the gym working out. I had one uncle that was, uh, you know, trying out for the NFL and was last cut for a team. And, you know, um, so fitness was something that was always considered uh, important. And uh, back then it was you always wanted to grow up, you know, to be bigger than your dad, bigger than your uncles, stronger. Um and you see all these role models on TV, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or, or, you know, Rambo. These are the guys, you know, you want to be bigger. And that was the whole focus, you know. Um, and, and now that has changed into uh, having a family and worried about being healthy, about being fit, about preventing chronic disease in the long term. Uh, so it's really... It's really kind of changed, um, and and as I became more educated, learning that the way you live your life definitely affects uh, your chances of living longer, having a healthier life, being able to be a dad for longer, being able to be a good husband. So, so it's definitely changed from just wanting to look cool and have big muscles and be stronger than other people to um, now wanting to be healthy in the long term and being able to be functional as long as I can throughout my life. Yeah, that, that seems to be a, a common theme as I, I talking to a lot of people on the show. Uh, a lot of them started with that aesthetic focus and a lot of them are now shifting to, to more functional, um, I guess, lifestyle changes where they, they want to be able to play with their kids as they get older and maintain some mobility and functionality. Did you ever go through that? Did you go through? Um, I mean, I know you were uh, a good track athlete. I mean, did you ever go through trying to get big, or were you always focused on kind of like speed, agility? Um, I mean, you were obviously strong. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I went through that phase as well. So I, I started off in kind of that bodybuilding sphere. Um, pretty much when I, I first started lifting, I got all of my information from remember the old uh, Arnold bodybuilding giant manual they used to have <laughs> yeah kind of thing. yep that's that's what got me started into lifting honestly I checked it out of the library one time and read it and so yeah I was I was really focused on like that bodybuilding aesthetic training 
Um, I, I shouldn't say completely because I wanted to be stronger too. So I, I focus on strength a lot, but yeah, a lot of uh, traditional exercises in the Globo gym and, and just focusing on like one muscle group at a time. And so I, I got to a point uh, right before I left to the army, I was about 238 pounds. So I was pretty heavy. Yeah. Uh, right now I'm walking around about 212 or so. So uh, I was considerably bigger, but even even so, I'm I'm stronger now than I have ever been. So that shift awesome. is, has been my cardio is vastly superior than it used to be. And I can't remember which uh, guest it was, but we were talking about. Um, I had probably about an eight year period where I didn't do any type of cardiovascular exercise at all. Yeah, I went through that. Definitely. I mean, I got up to 255, 253, 253, 255, something like that. Uh, it's kind of silly to think about now that you'd remember within, you know, two pounds, you know, that's how focused you were with getting big. Like, you know, every pound mattered. Um, but, you know, I was, I was getting stretch marks and stuff. And at the time it was like, oh, cool, you're pushing, like you're hulking out, you know, you're and like how disgusting you're tearing your skin i mean who like how distorted you know was my thinking that like oh you're pushing your body to get bigger it's just you know a side effect you know it everybody goes through it or yeah. uh, well now was that you you played college football right yeah yeah so when i finished college football i mean i only played I think for a year, I, I had an opportunity for a scholarship right out of high school, and then I went, um, you know, down to Harding, and I was going to focus on grades. I got bored after a semester, and then I went into, like, football for a year, and I mean, I was like a, at that time, I was probably like 220, 230 pound, well, I think I was 220 pound wide receiver. I mean, I was, uh, you know, not as tall as the other guys, and I was slow, so... Yeah. Not a great combination for a wide right. receiver spot. Uh, I mean, they were chocked full at linebacker. I mean, it, it was, uh, I wasn't the best in the world, but I started training with a guy down there that he was big and he, he used to work out in the pit with Arnold and stuff. Um, he was, he created the criterion uh, uh, equipment to lift with. And um, so he had like a, uh, a gym that we'd work out in and um he would kind of just adopt a couple boys and so he started training me and my brother i mean they were him and his wife were amazing we looked up to them uh big time and um they really taught us how to get big and strong uh and we put on a lot of weight and and i enjoyed that i mean i i missed that was kind of like a a CrossFit style workout. And I, I don't mean, actually, I, I'm saying that wrong. It wasn't a CrossFit style workout at all. The community aspect of CrossFit, where you, I mean, really build like close bonds with people, lifting, wow. working out. Uh, he had, you know, a few people worked out with him and everybody kind of looked up to him. And there was a very close community like working out specifically with him, people, you know, us younger college age kids wanted to be like him, you know, and uh, he did a lot of cool stuff too. He was in police, he was a sniper. And I mean, he had a cool resume, he did a ton of different jobs throughout his life. Um, just a smart guy. I mean, just uh, a, a guy that everybody enjoyed being around. And there was that really tight community and you didn't want to miss a day because you wanted to go see everybody and see what conversations you had that day. And it was, it, um, it was something I'll always cherish like that. Um, right. Well, it, kind of, it seems like it, it seems like it kind of was a uh, community. So you got some, some social aspect out of it. Like a good absolutely. environment. And, yeah. I never had that at like really to speak of at a regular gym. You might have like a buddy or something right. like that but this was his little garage gym and we were crammed in there and you had you know you know three to generally speaking not really more than five guys 
at a time working out and there was you know you maybe use one or two pieces of equipment at a time wait in line hit it again and they were great workouts they were hard workouts um and but that community aspect i mean that was huge i missed that immensely and then kind of crossfit with you and it was like a, that kind of experience again of like a tight knit group of people with all focused on being fit you know? yeah absolutely so what uh what led you away from that and into other styles of working out man well for, for me it was really weird and random like i missed um so when i moved back to ohio i didn't have that style of workout anymore i would try to replicate it a little bit in the gym and there wasn't the same equipment and i tried not to use that excuse as an excuse and i would still try to work out um, i ended up having shoulder surgery lung surgery and then um uh, i just felt like i was falling apart i wasn't getting to work out and and i wasn't in a great place mentally and then i was like i've got to try something i've got to do something and um i saw the advertisement up for for crossfit and i really didn't even know what it was uh i mean in college i was kind of anti-crossfit from the stuff i'd heard i thought it was another fad you know i didn't understand it at all and uh i was looking for something some sort of like community of of working out because i knew going to the gym wasn't going to do it and i was in pain physically um and that's that's when I stumbled into to your gym and I was still I mean um I was still fairly physical capable I mean I think my bench and my squat were still pretty decent when I had started uh there but I remember going in the first day yeah. and just getting obliterated I mean people were as strong or stronger than me but were doing many more reps and many other things I just went like right whoa i just got crushed absolutely crushed and uh and i enjoyed it and i saw you know the programming and i was just like this is something i can get into this is something i can focus on and uh uh i saw improvements i was having nerve pain um when i was going back to pulmonologist and stuff and he was like oh you're not gonna you're not gonna get out of this pain like it's always gonna be there it'll probably gradually get worse and as of about six or seven months ago now from now it took a while i went through with when i first started working out with you guys and doing the larger range of motions like it hurt i mean i was tearing scar tissue and um i didn't know i didn't really know if it was good or bad i knew i didn't want to stop because i was able to do more yeah. you know quantify that i was getting better but i didn't always necessarily feel better when you're tearing scar tissue and like you know that kind of affects your breathing and you lay at night and you wonder like is this is this good am i doing good or am i doing bad but when you can quantify that you're doing more to me that meant so, i'm headed in the right direction yeah increasing your work capacity so it was the um what was the biggest i guess setback that you had so you, so you had you have your shoulder surgery or your lung surgery first um i had shoulder surgery first and i had that right right before fire academy i believe yeah because i there was the question of whether or not i could take the test or not with my yeah. shoulder and then i went through fire um Man, and I had my lung surgery two and a half years later. I had my lung surgery. Okay. So what was your what was your biggest setback uh, with each of those, and how did, how did you get through those? Because a lot of people that you talk to, they have a lot of excuses. Uh, they had some kind of surgery, or they have some kind of pain, or some lingering illness, um, and it, it prevents them from starting into to exercise programs, but you had two major operations and it, it seems like you really didn't miss a beat. Yeah. I mean, um, 
I think compared to where I was, I I did. I mean, I there was many days I went home. I felt horrible. I mean, I, I would go home and my wife would have to put up with it. You know what I mean? I would moan and groan. And uh, uh, when I was actually working out, that was the only like solace that I got. That was the only time I wasn't in pain. That was the only time, like l- like while I was doing it, I felt okay. Generally right. speaking, I felt alive and I felt good. But when I would stop and I'd slow down and I'd go back and sleep, then I was in pain again. So it kind of almost became an addiction that like I want to feel good again. And like that narrow window um, was what I started looking for. Uh, after my shoulder surgery, I had, uh, you remember Jump Stretch? Yeah. At all? So uh-huh. the Big physical part. therapy group that I had, you know, I coached there a little bit. And there's a couple of physical therapists that I really liked that started working in there and, and going with, you know, some different ways of training there. After I had my shoulder, shoulder surgery, I knew them. So I went back to them and they were, and they pushed me. And so that was fun with the shoulder surgery. And I had goals of fire academy. I had goals, you know, I, I wanted to go work with human trafficking. I wanted to be a tactical yeah. with human trafficking. So I had the goal of like where I wanted to get to. And I just tried to, I don't know, I tried to ignore the pain, push through it, and then look for good things. And I can't say it was that way always, because there was many days I sometimes felt sorry for myself and was like, oh, you know, woe was me. Oh, yeah. I mean, what am I going to do? But you can only do that so long before you get bored and fed up and you got to make a choice, you know? Right. But, so you were planning goals all along. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you already had these goals. Good. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that seems like a big thing that uh, everybody I've talked to thus far who's, who's gotten to where they want to be, they, they've all had structured goals and, and they try to fit these different aspects within them. So what, uh, what was like your first motivation to start planning goals? Is it something you did on your own or is it something that your family kind of taught or is it something you learned from somewhere? I'm not, I'm not totally certain on that. I'm kind of... Um different in the fact that like I'm always looking at like long-term big goals and I think a lot of times to a lot of people I kind of sound um I don't know I don't know if crazy is the word but like I'm I'm looking at the the big these big long-term goals of where I want to get to be able to help people or be able to open gyms or be able to and a lot of times I'm not in the position to be able to do that you know when you when you have no money or you're still in school and you're still, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people who focus on just focus on today, focus on tomorrow. Um, me and my wife really balance each other out with that. Like I'm often looking at these bigger goals. Here's where I would like us to get to as a family or as a couple, um, in a couple years and then five years and 10 years and in, in, 50 years you know I know kind of what I hope our family will look like in that time and the things I want to be involved in where you know my wife is like the exact opposite and really good at like let's plan our budget exactly for today (laughs) let's plan exactly what we need for right now to get through Um, and so that's been hugely helpful to kind of bring those two worlds together and I think I help her too because she doesn't necessarily look as much at the long term as the like, well, what do we need to do now? And so having somebody like that that can help balance our goals together is the best of both worlds. I mean, it's it's really nice. And we respond well to each other with that. Absolutely. I think that's uh, maybe a big hang up that some people have is, you know, some people are really good at, at looking at long term but they're not good at making those short steps that they need to take in between to get to that long term goal making like like an action plan and then you have some people that are really really good at making these short steps but they're just treading water because they don't have a a a plan at the end or they're not trying to reach something specific that's good that you you guys can balance that out yeah yeah Yeah. that's something do you use journals or anything or you just kind of do it mentally you know what i don't um no, I mean, not in the 
sense of a traditional journal, I mean, I, I do lots of research and plan things out. Uh, not in the sense of a traditional journal, but I mean, I definitely have things that I look up and research and figure out this is this is how to get to that point. Sometimes I do well, sometimes I don't. I mean, I thought I'd have a gym by now. Yeah. Um, and that's been that's been really tough to make those things happen. You know, it, the, the saying, it takes money to make money. Um, yeah. I never believed it, but it uh, it's becoming more true. You know, uh, <laughs> the inability to, you know, we were even looking at putting in a gym here at the house and that with the massive school loan debt and stuff, um, our debt to income ratio, even with me and my wife having good jobs, you know, she's a yeah. pe pediatric nurse practitioner, I'm a police officer, good jobs. Um, but because of our school loans, our debt to income ratio, uh, we're not even able to get a, a ten or fifteen thousand dollar loan to get a, a building built to put the gym in, you know, yeah. with the equipment that we have in. Um it is. Yeah, it's so a struggle. It's between a rock and a hard place with with money, you know, sometimes. But uh, Yeah. No, it, I think that is that that, that can be uh that could be definitely be a factor that that stops things if you're not if you're not able to get the the working capital. So when I was looking at opening my well, I opened the first gym, and with opening the first CrossFit gym, I had uh, we moved into a really small place, knowing that we were going to outgrow it quickly for the same reason, uh, just because the the amount of money is going to cost to get into a bigger place, but. Uh, we had the benefit of we opened a smaller place for a group of people and then we grew from there. But uh, with this new one that I'm opening, same thing, like looking to break into the San Diego market and how how expensive it is and your cost of living. And you start balancing out your cash flow and, and balance sheets and trying to figure out what you actually need. Um, the amount of money, it, it can be overwhelming a little bit. When, when you see how much you have to go in the hole just to get something going. So I can totally relate. So do you, do you, are you still planning on doing it or are you, you going to put it on postponement or what are you kind of doing with that right now? Um, well, there's it's definitely still planning on doing it. I mean, that to me, that is a, it's a way that I want to give back to my family. It's a way I want to give back to the community. You know, my, my parents and, and family helped me to go through college, uh, to get to college, to get the education, to understand how to help people. Yeah. And I want to be able to do that. I mean, that's all I've, I don't know, it's all I've ever wanted to do is, is to be able to help people, to be able to make a difference and uh, change people's lives. I mean, there's so many people that that I'm close to that make poor health decisions. And if I don't change it for them, I know that they will likely die before they ever learn that, that those life decisions were a, were a bad decision. And without having the platform of like a, a gym and, you know, you become, you know, I, a lot of times I'll talk about fitness like at, while being a police officer and, 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 you know, people just, I know that they look at me like, well, what do you know, you're a police officer or they want to put their two cents in as though we're having like a discussion and I'm like, no, this isn't. A discussion like I'm telling you what's proper you know yeah. and, and it's hard to well you're a police officer what do you know about that kind of stuff you know um, it's hard to have that platform or my doctor said I should go walk so I'm 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 good because I'm walking like no you're not walking is only for the most deconditioned people you know like that's not gonna get your neuroendocrine release that's not gonna get you all you know the markers of health that we're looking for to change and um, it's not going to do that. And you try to educate slowly and make a difference, but to have a platform where you can say, look, just come with me for even a month, you know, yeah. stay with me. And, and I know that you have these aches and pains. I know like I've had aches and pains too. I have surgeries. I have three pens in my shoulders. I've had part of my lung removed and they hit a nerve and I have abdominal pain. And you know what I mean? Like yeah. to be able to say like, it's okay it's okay. Like, relax, come, we'll scale this down for you. And I want you to have 
have life, you know, and uh, and right. and I I attribute it back a lot back to my Christianity. I mean, you know, in the Bible you see, you know, people could actually heal people. I can't heal people with a touch. I'd love to be able to do that, but I can heal people with my brain, you know, and and help educate them about how amazing their body is and what it's capable of. And people just don't appreciate. It. They think you get old and die, you know, you just get old and you have to become geriatric and you have to become, have these aches and pains and, and this is our lot in life and this is just terrible. And to be able to tell them like, you are amazingly made. You are, you have so much to still offer your value to society. You, you know, a lot of people get older and they don't feel that they're valued anymore and they don't feel that they're important. And to be able to pull them back in and say, you have value. You are important. This is, uh, this is still an amazing life. Like, let's show what you're capable of. And I've gotten to do it some, but not near as much as I'd like to be able to do for people. And and a lot of times it's loved ones, and I'm watching them age. And it, for me, it's been what I went to college, started in 2005, so 13 years. And in 13 years, I've watched a lot of loved ones age and become sick and have health problems and it's almost uh it's, it's mentally tough to feel like you can make a difference in their lives and not have the means to be able to do it you know so I, so i'm definitely yeah. gonna open the gym uh lord will and i'll have, we'll figure out the money and i've got some other business things going and if anything falls into place we'll be okay but well, I think a lot of people, you know, it's funny that you bring up that they say you're just a cop that you don't know anything, but you are also an EMT and a paramedic and a firefighter and an athletic trainer, and you have education in that and you have experience in that. And not only that, but you, you went through it for yourself. So with those two injuries, um, you are walking proof that you can be at a, a pretty fit level and retain most of your ability to interact with life, even though you've had some setbacks. So I think... Oh, yeah. uh, I think having that platform, like you said, is great. That's that's the one, the one thing that I really appreciate about owning a gym is, um, especially a, a functional fitness, is the ability to create that community with inside of it and to be to be the living proof of what you're selling to them. So, um, being being the example, just. Same as when I was a, a, an army officer, trying to be exactly what you would want your other people to be and living it and talk, not just talking it, but living it. So, absolutely. I mean, leading from the front. Uh, and you had, you had a following because people wanted to be around you. You know, yeah. they could see what you wanted to do. And, and you, it's not that um, necessarily that you were the most entertaining person in the world or that, you know, it's not that people were. Like you led by example, you know, yeah. you didn't have to talk like you let your, your, uh, physicality show like, this is what I'm capable of. And, you know, and then you train people to, to heights that was past what they thought they could do. I mean, I know I encountered that for sure. Um, and that's been a, a great, uh, lesson for me to learn from is that lead by example like you have to you have to try to lead by example you know you, you might not be the physically the best person in the world maybe you get lucky and you could train a regional or a games athlete or something like that but like you have to you have to try you know and yeah. in, in your case you've been able to excel which is even more helpful but you have to push yourself if you're asking that from other people you you have to be willing to do that for yourself and when you see somebody else do it i mean you know, there's times where you'd have workouts. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's humanly possible. And then you do it and crush it. And I'm like, okay, it's, I'm just a sissy. All right. I need to get my, my mind on straight here, you know? And, uh, so being able to learn from people in your situation is just, it's been so helpful. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, uh, as a coach, you need to, you need to believe in your people. I mean, people are, are capable of far more than they think they're capable of. And, and it's really easy for people to get comfortable and they set their excuses and, and they just kind of settle in. It, you know, you're talking about the walking thing. Um, for somebody that's completely 
deconditioned, that's obese, if there's anybody out here listening that's like that, walking is a good start. It'll get you into a, a, a routine, but walking can't be your end. I mean, if you're using that as a catalyst to get into a program and you're going to start walking because from now you're used to working out at 4.30 every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I went on my walk. I'm going to go to the gym or whatever, any, any type of fitness regime you want to get into. Um, I think that's a good way to start. It's, it's better than nothing, but um, your end goal shouldn't be just to walk. Walking is how you get from point A to point B. Uh, everybody should be able to walk. So I, I think I, I see what you're saying, and I totally agree. You that's an that's an amazing goal. point. You really you worded it better than I would. I'm not walking, knocking walking, but yeah. uh, that's a lot of people's goal. I mean, that's a lot of people right. got out and walked, and that's a lot of doctors' advice, or it seems to be. Talked to so many old people, and my doctor told me to get out and walk. Right. Why? Why didn't your doctor tell you to get out and work out? Why didn't they tell you to? I mean. Why don't they tell you how to eat right and stuff too? And they don't have time. And I'm, it's not about. I'm not trying to knock. Not trying to knock doctors, but um, I just hear that so often, so often from a lot of loved ones. You know that are like they're older. You know, like grandparents and um, you know people that I encounter. Well, the doctor told me to walk. Well, that's great, but you need so much more. Like that's. That's the start of it. That's not your goal. You know, like, yeah. let's work on, like, being able to live and bend down and stand up and be able to sit in a chair without needing assistance to get up. Like, yeah, we got a lot more things that we want to work on here. How about balance issues? And um, I don't know. It's funny how walk-ins become like the, like, that's, myth, you know, it's just going to save your life. I, I don't know. It's It's weird. Yeah, well, it's easy. I mean, it's not easy at first for some people, but um, it's far easier than than doing squats. Or it's far easier. Honestly, it's it's far easier than doing yoga. I know you're not a big fan of yoga, but um, it's easier. I mean, it's it's not strenuous. Walking's not very strenuous once you get into a routine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I I think with the Dave and I were talking about the functional medicine stuff, and he's he's going to be pursuing that. And um, just how disconnected doctors are. So you were talking about leading by example. How many times you went to a doctor's office and, and the doctor that's sitting there that's prescribing something he looks like they're in need of your services? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you, you look like more of the expert than they are when you look at them and their lifestyle choices and, and their work-life balance and their probably exercise routine and their nutrition. So I'm not yeah. talking doctors either. You need them. Um, I was just, I, I, I think I might have been talking about this, but you remember the old Glassman, uh, the old Glassman speech where he's talking about how doctors are, uh, doctors are lifeguards and coaches are swim coaches, like, yes, I, how. I believe I saw this, um, it's been a while. So he is basically just saying how, uh, how the job of a coach is basically if you had a person and they're they're in the water, a coach is somebody that's going to teach them how to swim. And if they know how to swim and they're in the water, they're fine. But if they never came to the coach to learn how to swim and now they're drowning, they don't need a coach anymore. They need a lifeguard. So that's the doctor. So, yeah. you know, the, the whole point of coaching, I think, is the preventative side. And you're trying to prevent people from needing being ill and, and needing those services as much. Yeah, absolutely. I love that analogy. That's a, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, that was, that was one of the better ones I've heard. So, anybody listening, uh, if you haven't started a program yet, get out and start one. And if, if you think that you're drowning, go see your doctor first and uh, make sure you're healthy enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there was a... Uh, oh, man... These are things that I, if we ever got into it in the future, to prepare. Um, I had a teacher that worked under, uh, I think it was his name was William Costell. I can't remember. He's like the father of exercise science. I'm probably going to butcher this for people that are actually educated and 
stayed up with this. It's been years ago for me. Uh, but um, this student would uh, have heart attack patients that would come in and the doc would put them on the treadmill and I guess like run them to death. And, and you know, this student was like, he said, I'd sit there like mortified, like this person's going to have a heart attack. This person's going to die. And uh, the doc would just keep pushing them, keep pushing them. He said, the, he goes, I never, ever once saw them have a heart attack. I never saw him actually kill anybody. I never saw him. And uh, he's the one who essentially wrote the books, to my understanding, of a lot of the exercise science stuff made a huge uh, impact on it. And it was even after people had all of these problems, um, they. OK, right now. OK. Um, hey, buddy. So yeah. as we're talking about this stuff, uh, I might have to cut this uh, short now. Yeah, yeah. Um, apparently my grandfather's having some some issues right now. Uh, they said they might take him by ambulance right now out to uh, out to the hospital. So I'm going to go run over and check on him. I'm sorry to cut this short. Hey, no worries, man. Totally understandable. He's one I want to get the gym open for. So Yeah. Hey, I can, I can understand that. Uh, will you go take care of your business? And uh, we'll catch up to you another time. All righty, buddy. Take care. All right. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye.